fictional storyteller is the, how do you describe, he's indescribable, the indescribable Christopher Krogan. And by the middle of it, a lot of things become very common. Closer. <laughs> so by then, a lot of things become very common. And I was woken up by a blast that shook the house that we were living in. But by that time, it was so common that we wore boots to sleep. So I get up, I pull up my pants, I put on my gear, and I hear that my friend Forrester had been hit with an IED. But he was close. So we run out the front door, head to the right, and he's only about 100 meters down the road. And as I get to him, when I smell that copper and sulfur that's present with any combat, I see his wounds. Half of his hand is worn off, his face is shredded up by shrapnel. But then I get up to him. And this has been so common by then that a wave of relief came over him. He had both of his eyes, he was conscious, and when I stepped into the pool of blood next to him, it was shallow. So I knew we could save him, get him on a bird, get him to Germany, and he was going to live. So I leaned down, and I'm holding his hand, and he looks up at me and he says, get the motherfuckers who did this. Well, obviously, hell yeah, brother, this is what we do, right? So then, a couple months go by, and I come home. And I realize that I've completely shut off my loved ones and my family. I don't really know why. But one of the ones that hurt the most was my little brother, David. When I deployed, he was 11, 12 years old. You know, normal kid, five and a half feet tall, 80 pounds soaking wet, his arms and legs are way too big for his body, he has a stupid sixth grade haircut. <laughs> <laughs> but I didn't spend any time with him. I didn't understand why. Now before, in 2003, 2004, 2005, I feel like I spent a good amount of time, you know, he has dyslexia, so I run Harry Potter before I went to bed. You know, he had homework, so we knocked that out together. Want to get better at basketball, so of course, I rebounded for him, right? And when he's that old, like, everything that I told him, he just, he ate it up. You know, I was his big war fighter brother. I could do no wrong. I was like a fifth grade god to him. You know, in every household, place of worship has its own gospel. So I guess you could say my brother grew up in the church of Kroger. It's <laughs> <laughs> a good line, right? <laughs> but once I got back from 07, I didn't spend any time with him. I didn't understand why. I was depressed. I was isolated. I was drunk. And from 07 to 2014, I just kept the point. I was either at home, isolated, and drunk, or I was trained to go to war, or I was at war. And then once 2014 happened, and I decided to not deploy anymore, the next couple of years I was just isolated, drunk, and depressed. Now about a year ago, I was drunk, isolated, and depressed, and I was driving, and I got into DUI. And they put me into a program in Fairfax County called the Veterans Court. And there was a shit ton of stuff you have to do. You have to write papers, you have to do uh, PTSD groups, you have to do single groups, you have to be volunteering, you have to go to court a couple times a month, you have to meet your PO every day, you have to piss into a cup every other day. It's ridiculous, but it helped a lot. And once I started to sober up, I started looking at my war and trying to connect my PTSD dots to my little brother, why there was this disconnect. Now, a couple months ago, my brother and I were moving some furniture in my basement. And I turn off the lights, and he runs up the stairs like a spider monkey. We've all done it. We've all done it when you're tagged, and you turn off the lights, and there's a goblin in the basement, and you have to make it up before you get to it. You know what I'm Well, I'm looking behind him, and I don't see my 24-year-old brother. I see my 12-year-old. And then all of a sudden, I'm not in my basement. I'm in rubble and collusion of the house of the guy who hurt my friend Forrester. I have that same copper sulfur smell. I look down at him. He's about five and a half feet tall. He's about 80 pounds soaked wet. His arms and legs are too big for his body. He 
he has a stupid fucking six straight head. And then I look next to him in the rubble, and it's his 20, 21 year old warfighter brother who told his younger brother to drive a propane tank into a hole to hurt my friend. Because he did it, right? Because the older brother word is gospel at this point. What clicked in my head, what the disconnect was. What if I had come home and I was so terrified of this and I taught my brother something where he would use it to hurt somebody else or get hurt himself? What if I taught him to fucking hate other human beings? So I cut it off. But I found the wound. So I started the suture. I started being present in my family's life. Family dinners, long talks with my brother, going on to the Midwest to see people I haven't seen in half a decade. Ago. And you know, I'm sad that I missed out on like Tom Riddle and long division and bounce passes. <laughs> but I'm making new memories of discussions about video games and Fortnite and uh, watching him do his woodworking, which he's amazing at. He has a shop in my garage. And, you know, arguing about the wage gap, which he always kicks my ass out of because he's so fucking smart. He's getting his master's degree now. Like, and I think that I know that this wound will never heal fully. But I think it's going to spar over. And if I look down at that wound in five or ten years, and the scar is a patchwork of memories that I'm creating with my brother now, it might be a pretty good scar to have. <laughs>